I would like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of 1 Peter. If you'll have your Bible open to 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll begin in just a moment with verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Often in the Christian life, we talk about when people are ready to die. Are they ready to die? And most of the time, we connect that with a conversation about the gospel and eternal life in Christ. And we tend to lean toward the idea if they're ready to die, that cares for everything else. But the emphasis we find here in the word of God is about being ready to live. To be ready to live. Now we would imagine that people would think if they're ready to die, they're ready to live. But the opposite is true. If we're really ready to live for Christ, then we're ready to meet him in death. I want you to think of that. Someone said recently in some seminar, and they repeated it to me, that 95% of what is done in our work in the ministry is given to trying to get the gospel to people to see them make a profession of faith. I'm all for that, of course, because the Lord Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have five parts to the Great Commission. One part is in the gospel according to Matthew, one in the gospel according to Mark, one in the gospel according to Luke, one in the gospel according to John, and of course in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. All five parts make the whole. There's something a little different about each of those parts to make the whole. And we must go with the gospel. But then a small percentage of effort is given to discipling people. And I think if we were giving the attention that we ought to give properly to discipling people and teaching and training people or placing the responsibility upon people to follow the Lord, to be a true follower of the Lord, we would have even more people coming to know Christ because the natural outgrowth of following the Lord Jesus is being a fisher of men. In reality, if we're not fishing for men, there's something wrong with our following the Lord because he said, follow me and you shall become fishers of men. So if we haven't become fishers of men, then evidently the evidence is that we're not truly following him. Now, Peter had his troubles. If you're familiar with the Bible, especially the New Testament, you know that Peter had his troubles. But he was a great man and God used him in a mighty way. He was a broken man. I believe we learn in life that God uses those that go through this brokenness. So let's see what he has for us here in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark two expressions in the 15th verse, if you would, please. One, be ready. And then a reason of the hope. And I ask this question, what is the reason for our hope? What is your reason to be hopeful? What is our reason for hope? Hope is an amazing thing. As a matter of fact, it's an element of faith. The Bible says, if you turn please quickly to Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter begins, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now that's God's word about creation. 
and that wonderful word framed is given to us. We can be very grateful to God that we live in a, a, a world where things are perfectly put together and held together by the Lord. But here we have the mention of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. This is a description of faith. A definition of faith is found in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So if you are asked about faith, what is faith? Faith is described as the substance of things hoped for. And hope we find as an element of faith. I have faith. The object of my faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. People can have faith in many things or many people. But we're talking in particular about our faith in Christ, our faith in God. We believe that the Lord Jesus is co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So when we say our faith in Christ, we're talking about our faith in God. And faith described as the substance of things hoped for, the substance of things hoped for. We must have hope to live and to live victoriously. And the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. This is what comes from our faith in God. And if someone says, well, what does, what does faith mean? What is the definition of faith? And it's simple, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. If faith is defined as looking unto Jesus, turning away and to him, turning away from other things and to him, turning away from all things and turning to him, if looking unto Jesus is the definition of our faith, and hope is one of the rich, ripe, wonderful elements of that faith, then all of that hope and faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. Now with that in mind, let's go back to the verse just for a moment. Again, I read to you verse 15 of 1 Peter chapter 3. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you. And of course we're to do that with meekness and fear, yielding the Lord and fearing God. What is the reason? What reason do we have? If you go back to chapter 1 in 1 Peter, we began to read with chapter 1 verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Would you mark that expression? A lively or living hope. A lively hope. We have been begotten again. Paul talks about this toiling, this, this again in birthing Christians. And what we, what we go through in birthing Christians until Christ be formed in them. Here he says, I have been begotten again. Begotten again. This, he's not talking about his new birth here. But I have been begotten again unto a lively hope. How? How did that happen? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The great evidence the great foundation, the great substance of our hope is that he lives. He lives. He said to his disciples, because I live, ye shall live also. He said, behold, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Peter did not lose his faith when he denied the Lord Jesus, denied that he knew him, but he lost his hope. And he needed that hope begotten again. That's what the resurrection did for him. It was begotten again 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I'm sure there are people to whom I speak whose hope is just flittering, you know, just barely kept alive. Because that hope can be misplaced. It can be misplaced. It can be put in something we hope to happen. It doesn't happen. Or it can be placed in confidence in someone that doesn't live up to that expectation. And God is constantly working in our lives to bring us to the point where, where we're looking unto Jesus. We're looking unto Jesus and that hope is begotten again. That lively hope, that living hope, that excitement and thrill and hope that comes by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want you to go with it just for a moment back in the gospel record according to Luke. Peter is about to have his great difficulty in Luke chapter 22. And the Lord says to him in verse 31 of Luke chapter 22, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. I have given a long series of messages on Satan. I've, I've just thought recently I'm going to bring a, a message on Satan's best sermons. You can find them in the Bible, his best sermons. In other words, they have the greatest effect adversely on the children of God because we're ignorant of his devices, confusion, deceit, discouragement. But Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I think it's very important. Now, I'm stretching it a bit, and you'll have to be patient with me. But notice what he's praying for. What is Christ praying for? He's praying that his faith does not fail. He didn't lose his faith. If you'd ask him immediately after this, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior? I honestly believe he would have said that, but he lost something. And there are thousands of Christians all across our land and around the world who need their hope renewed. They need a lively hope again. They need to be reminded to look to the Lord and find their hope in Him. But he goes on to say, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, this is not as we might imagine when he comes to know Christ as his Savior. Salvation is the work of the Lord. Uh, there is a moment, a faith moment, where we repent of our sin and by faith come to know Christ as our Savior. But there's a conversion that must take place in Peter's life. A conversion to Christ's likeness. That conversion needs to take place in all of our lives. That conversion needs to take place in every church. Every church that I know anything about needs to be converted. Converted to Christ's likeness. And he says, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And we see Peter converted. The great chapter in John chapter 21 where the great question is asked about loving the Lord. Then we see him empowered by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and preaching and thousands being saved. Something happened to the man, didn't it? Something happened and changed his life. And we long for those things to take place in our lives so that we are more useful to God the Lord receives greater glory from our lives. But when he says, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, First and Second Peter, the epistles of First and Second Peter are a product of that. God gives them these epistles to write to strengthen the brethren. Uh, Jeremiah lived in hazardous, hazardous days. We walked together through the book of Jeremiah into the Lamentations and we've seen that. But Jeremiah was sent down to a potter and I want to bring this to this moment in which you and I are living. And he watched a potter at the wheel and he watched a vessel marred and he watched the vessel made again on the potter's wheel. God spoke to him about the marring of his people and how God could make them again and he went with that message of hope. And when he preached that message of hope to Judah, they said to him, there is no hope. We live in a world in our own country where people are doing everything they can to get here. 
but we lead the world in suicide. What's the reason for that? You find people who are spent by the time they're 15 or 16 years old. What's the reason for that? You find people who, who've gotten so disillusioned with marriage, they don't even try to go through the motions of being married anymore, but they are soon disillusioned with life. And now we live, we live in sexual anarchy in our own country. Sexual anarchy what people think makes them feel good, they just decide they're going to do with no boundary. With no boundary. Lasciviousness, unleashed sexual, unbridled sexual behavior and desire. What's happened? People have lost hope. Most never had it. They had misplaced hope, not in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why God's people are so important in this world because it's our responsibility to live the kind of life that demonstrates to others that we have a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I want to ask you frankly, do you have that lively hope? Do you have it? What is the reason for your hope? What is the reason for your hope? Because people may not even verbalize the question. But if you have any demonstration of Christianity in your life, maybe you don't go where they go when they're all going the wrong place or you don't listen to what they say when they're all saying the wrong thing in the office. Or perhaps you don't put in your body what they put in theirs when you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and maybe go very quietly about it. But they want to know, why do you live that way? And you and I live the way we live because we have the hope that we have. What is the reason for it? Let's, let's go back here to this, to this text. I want you to write these simple things down and I want to do this quickly because I don't want you not to rejoice. I'm rejoicing in the, the political decision made by America in the last 24 hours. and all that led up to that. But we have not elected a savior. And that is not where our hope is anchored. Now, I don't want to be negative about it. I want to be as positive as I can be and I think Christians should be the best citizens in the whole country. But we mustn't get our eyes off the Lord. Because if we, if we take our eyes off the Lord and put them on some political revival, then we will get perhaps what the political revival can produce, but we will not get what God desires to do in our land. And I, I want to see the Lord accomplish what he desires to accomplish in my life and in our land. Now, don't belittle what is done. I think that's discouraging to people. Don't belittle it. Be excited about it. Be thrilled about it. Talk about it. Identify with it. But in your heart, in your heart, you know that's not the real answer this nation needs. And in their hearts, <laughs> they know that's not the real answer this nation needs. Our vice president has said over and over and over, our newly elected vice president said over and over and over, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And so he knows that. Aren't you grateful he knows that? So write these things down. If we're going to be ready to give the reason for the hope that's in us, we must be people who have made the preparation. Would you write that? We must make the preparation. When I came to know the Lord as my Savior, I, I announced to my mother in the evening, that evening after I got home from the meeting where I, I came to know the Lord, I said, I'm saved. Often we make a mistake by just giving half of that to people and we say to a person, now you're saved. If the Holy Spirit comes to live in a person, 
comes to live in a person, and that happens when you're born again, the Holy Spirit will give that witness to you that you're one of his. People can make professions of faith, and that's wonderful. Well, that's what we're after. May God help us go in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Give a clear presentation of the gospel. You see, I'm different from some people I know and love. I believe Christ tasted death for every man, so I can't give the gospel to the wrong person. So I want to go in the power of God's Holy Spirit and give a clear presentation of the gospel and bring a person to the point of receiving or rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. And for all those hundreds of people I've seen through the years who have prayed and invited Christ in their life as Savior, I believe that God will make himself known to them. As a matter of fact, when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, we're never by ourselves ever again, ever. He is a constant companion. He is inescapable. He is in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hope, the hope we need, now is in us. But there's the idea sometimes, well, that's the end of it. No, that's the beginning of it. So we need to get in the word of God, this preparation, this communion with the Lord, this learning to pray, this memorizing verses of scripture and passages of scripture. There's an ongoing love and increasing love for the Lord and his word. There's a constant journey here, working, moving into God, like the preacher from Toronto, uh, Smith, who wrote the beautiful song from the People's Church, Into the Love of Jesus, Deeper and Deeper I Go. You'll never, never find the bottom or the top or the width or the breadth. So it is preparing and preparing not learning about him, but learning him. This book is God's revelation of himself. He wrote it for us, for us to know him. It is progressive in its nature. He constantly is revealing himself to us. But this preparation must be made. If you really want to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you, a reason to people, you've got to make the preparation. Then secondly, there must be Love of the person of Jesus Christ. Do we know him? Do we know him? All doctrinal soundness comes from a biblical foundation and comes out of what we know to be true in the person of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it's dangerous to study doctrine or to study theology apart from the person of Jesus Christ. It's dangerous. And so... Do you know him? There are many people about, who know about me but don't know me. Uh, I am to my wife a husband, to my brother a brother, to my children a, a father, to my grandchildren a papa, uh, to my nieces an uncle, to my friends a friend, to my fellow associates in the Lord's work uh, a Christian associate. But I'm the same person. And when we look uh, through this prism of the word of God into the person of the Jesus Christ, it's unending what we, what we see and know about him, what we find that is true about him, the loveliness of Christ, the simplicity which is in Christ Jesus. Look at the words of scripture here in verse 15, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. And I know the word for most of us would simply mean to set apart, to set apart. It really means to give him the place that no other has. You know I, I believe this, but I'm to live it out on a daily basis. He has a place my wife doesn't have in my life. And my wife has, I hope, the highest place any wife could have in a husband's heart because Christ has a different place in my life than she has. This church, I love this church. I mean by that the people, not the buildings and the grounds. I'm not in love with these buildings. They're all going to burn. But I'm in love with the people. I'm in love with the people here. But the Lord has a place in my heart that the people don't have in my heart. And I'm the one who has to work at that. If I'm going to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in me, it's all going to be connected to the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know him? What do you know about him? Is he your constant companion? Do you know you have access to him? Do you know 
What else about him? There's so much to learn of him. You see, some people say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm going to tell people I'm a Christian and the Lord came to earth and bled and died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and I trust him as my Savior and I'm ready for it. No, you're not ready. You're not ready if you haven't made the preparation through knowledge of the Word of God and knowledge of the things of God. You're not ready and I'm not ready unless we truly know the person. We've set him apart in our lives. And the place he has determines the place everything else and everyone else has. If he is out of his proper place, what is his proper place? Preeminence. Not one of, but the one and only. The one and only. If I said to my wife, you know, you're one of the women I love. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't stay there long carrying on like that. But just to illustrate it, the Lord Jesus does not desire to be one of. He, he demands to be the one and only then that all things in all things he might have the preeminence. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Here's the strangest thing in the world and the most wonderful thing in that strange thing. Anywhere, anytime, any place, any moment, any moment we can be completely at peace with the person of Christ and communing with him. Other things don't, don't control that if we've sanctified him and given him. If I'm standing in a place where there are loud, boisterous people who are against God and I know I should speak a kind word about Christ and what people can know about him and I'm ready to give a reason for the hope that's in me, living consciously in his presence, recognizing him for who he is, that he is greater than all else and all other people, enables me to speak boldly and compassionately in his presence. Why do you think Elijah could go in to the court of Ahab and announce what he announced? Why could John the Baptist preach to Herod like he did? Because they were not alone. They were in the presence of the Lord. That's what we want. That's what we need. So it requires the person of Christ. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Set him apart above all else, above all, of, above all others. Come to know him. Be the husband that Christ would have you be. The wife Christ would have you be. The son or daughter, the father or mother. There's a third thing. And that requires purity. Purity. I'm going to try to explain something here with God's help, and I want you to help me. Would you please? Would you follow along? To sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, because I know what I know about Peter, I'm thinking what I'm thinking about Peter when the maid and others approached him before the fire as he warmed his hands by that fire and he denied finally before the cock crew that he ever even knew him. He wasn't ready. Something had happened to him. If you'd quizzed him and really pressed him and said, are you, are you someone who knows Christ? You have faith? He saw his miracles. He was one of the intimate ones. I think he would have said, I haven't lost my faith, but something's happened to my hope. Has something happened to your hope? And he's writing here, having a good conscience. We have a conscience. Now, you can sear your conscience, harden it. You can, you can make your conscience unclean. You personally can sin against your conscience. God says of people who deny God that they're fools. They say in their heart, there's no God. Well, they, they trample over their conscience because they're made. Every human being who comes to this earth knows there is a God by conscience and by creation. There's enough of the knowledge of God to condemn them, but not enough to save them. Someone must give them the gospel. Even that wonderful lady, Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf and Annie Sullivan who came to her and she said 
my soul was born when Annie came. When Philip Brooks came to Helen Keller and told her about Jesus through Annie Sullivan's interpretation to her, Helen Keller said, I've always known there was a God. I just didn't know what he was like. Think of that. So he talks about having a good conscience. That's what our goal is. That whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that's the world. They may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, the way you live your life in Christ. For it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. That's two types of suffering. God will bless you for being treated badly and poorly for being doing the right thing, but he'll chasten you as a Christian for evil-doing. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. I have written on that and put it in print. I hope you'll read it if you have some curiosity about that. Between his death and resurrection. Which sometime ye were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing within wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. I think we understand they were on board the ark. But what about when they went on the ark and there was no rain and nothing? What about when they built the ark and there was no rain? The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. And then there's a parenthesis. You notice that? How many of you notice that? Would you raise your hand? You notice that? When there's a parenthetical statement in any author's writing, it is not necessary to make sense, but it's done by the author to help the reader understand what he has written. And the same thing here. We learn that from the Holy Spirit. God gives us by his Spirit this parenthetical statement. I could read like this. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. And I could go all the way to the end of the parenthetical statement and read by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the parenthesis is here to give us understanding. So let's get it. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. I say to you for the Christian, now listen to me please, for the Christian, this is one of the greatest statements in the Bible. One of the greatest statements in the Bible. You think, do you think we're gonna be less understood now because we've elected a president that's supposedly a little different from the one we've had? Do you think the world is gonna to come to the Christian and applaud the Christian? Please don't be believing that. Friendship the world is always what? It's what? Enmity with God. Now that doesn't mean I want to be rough and hard-headed and bully people around and, and have no Christ-likeness. That's all settled by the fruit, singular, F-R-I-U-T, fruit, singular, with nine graces, the fruit of the Spirit. That's all settled. God can make you rough, bone-headed people like Christ. He can. By dying to self and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through your life. But what's he talking about here? He's giving an illustration, a figure. He said when people watch that ark being built and accused and mocked, when they went inside that ark, they gave a testimony. Look, please a testimony of what they believed, what they really had in their heart, what was inside them. They gave that testimony of what was inside them. By their actions, they gave that testimony of what was inside them. I say if we're going to be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us, it requires preparation. We've got to work at this. 
There'll be tests, just like there would be a test in a schoolroom. There'll be tests come to us that we need to be prepared for, preparation, to be able to pull up scripture that we've memorized and talk about and answer these temptations with the word of God. We have to have set apart the person of the, of the Lord that he is above all else in our lives. No one has the place he has. We sanctify the Lord in our heart, but we must have purity. We must be ready to answer, and the answer must be with a good conscience. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't want you to try to figure it out because it's just foolishness to try to figure it out. But people have said things about me that are not true. People with influence have said things about me that are not true. People have deliberately, now misinterpreting is one thing, but deliberately trying to hurt you is a different matter. People have done that through the years. All of us in the Lord's work have had that happen, haven't we? Haven't we? How do you deal with it? You cannot run down everything that's been said or done and try, hey, 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 you and I are going to have to have a talk about this. I'm going to get you straightened out. Now, whoa, wait, wait a minute. You can't say that about, no, that, that can't be done. You can't constantly run around trying always to take care of every little fire some devil starts. You can't do it. But you can live before God with an answer of a good conscience, knowing that what they say is not true and knowing, here's the thing, that God knows it's not true. You understand that? Now, if evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, there may be times when it appears that there are people who truly know the Lord, and they do, who come to our aid and we come to their aid. But this world system, this world system is evil. It is controlled by lustful desire. It is driven by ambition. You and I are in this world, but we're living in another world while we're living in this world. And if we're going to be ready, and oh God help us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in us, then we're going to have to prepare for that. That's why the disciplined life, staying in the word of God, memorizing, meditating upon scripture, using scripture, is necessary. That's why Sanctifying the Lord, that person of Christ, has to be done. He has to have a place no one else has. Then purity of heart, purity. We have to keep a good conscience, unsoiled. Keeping the shortest accounts. Keeping things clean. Confessing, agreeing with God. I'm right. No, you're right. I'm wrong. And he not only forgives, he cleanses us. He cleanses us and keep that conscience clean. And then as we live our lives, just as surely as Noah went on board that ark and by his very action he demonstrated to an unbelieving world, I believe God, I trust God, my hope is in God. And they could say whatever they wanted to say. No doubt they mocked him and made him out to be a fool. But he had a good conscience. And you and I, in this world in which we travel, must work on a daily basis, even moment by moment, to keep a good conscience that will answer. Look at it, please. The answer of a good conscience toward God. Let's pray together, may we?